Thank you. And it is always, always such a joy and a pleasure to be here with all of you as we gather in the house of our Lord with the people of God and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this hopefully snow-free Sunday. I would like to invite you to stand and join in our hymn of redemption, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. You know, for many of us, that song holds so much meaning to particular times in our life or uh, events, funerals, weddings. I'm often reminded of how gracious the Lord was 
to redeem a man who was a slave trader to write that song and spend the rest of his years in service to Christ. Such a beautiful story. I would like to take a moment now to direct your attention to our announcements. There are a few things that we'd like to highlight and share with you this morning. Um, First of all, directly following worship today, we will be gathering um, downstairs in the fellowship hall for a, a brief luncheon and more importantly, an opportunity to get together as a church family and share about our next steps in our pastoral search. Um, today we welcome Reverend Leon Oaks. He will not only be preaching today, but he will also be talking to us a little bit about um, a transitional process and a church finding its identity um, in that new world of ministry and as we go forward to set the table well for our next pastor, whoever he or she may be. I would also like to make note that Marie Lewandowski has sent her thank yous for the lovely cards and she really appreciated being our person of the week and she sends her blessings. We would like to send a special thank you to Taylor and Coleman Searle for their work at the Parsonage. There are still many things to do around the church and the Parsonage as we spring up and get ready to put our best foot forward this summer. If you would like to be a part of any of those projects, please contact Carol and she will surely put you to work post haste. Um, this, this, the fifth, Thursday, I think, is uh, the blood drive here at the church. Um, when I signed up last week, there were still a few spots left, and the need is always great, um, nationally and internationally, as the need for medical supplies and blood donations is very high. Please uh, consider signing up and making a donation while the Red Cross is here in town this week. And there are, of course, other amazing opportunities to serve in the ministries and programs of our church. Um, you will find lists and signups and folks you can talk to. If you want to get involved, we do have a place for you to do so, whether it's in the rummage room, helping with some of our meals, or even helping in worship on a Sunday morning. You can see Carol, Claudia, myself, Lois, all of those folks will be able to help direct you where your skills and talents will really flourish. Uh, on the 4th this week, we'll be starting a midweek Bible study from 7 to 8. Um, I did order the books, and if you want to jump in, you are more than welcome, and we can get you a book rather quickly if you'd like to. Um, and just a quick note that the Wired Word will take a couple weeks off, um, one for our meeting this Sunday, and in remembrance or in honor of Mother's Day, next Sunday they will not be meeting. So we just wanted to make note for your schedules on that. And let us move now to a time of prayer and reflection as we lift up the cares and needs of those around us. Um, I would like to um, continue to ask prayer for Karen Strand and her family as they grieve the passing of both of her parents. Um, her father passed away on Easter, and shortly thereafter, her mother also went home to be with the Lord. We continue to pray for Patty Hubbard's, Patty Hibbard's um, cousin Sandy as she goes through a long medical journey and some of the other depression issues that can go with something like that. Um, we have long-term prayer continued in our list for Penny and for Ross, for Luann, Bill, Peg Baker, uh, Linda Goldway. I did see her the other day. She's finally released back out into the wild and she was on her way to therapy. So we continue to pray that her recovery goes well. We pray for Ginger Kelsey, Steve Wise, Ryan Yates, for Mel Hayward and Lindsay Scott. We pray for Audrey and Grace. We pray for Brandon, Dick Leeson. We pray for Jason and his daughter, Logan. And we also will be praying for uh, Megan's grandmother, Patricia, as she has a biopsy coming up this week, and we want to pray for not only her health and good results, but also for the anxiety that comes with these things. And so many concerns and prayers that are brought quietly or unspoken, we all are carrying something with us that we are in so desperate need of for the Lord to heal or 
smooth over or apply his mercies to. And let us go now before the throne. Heavenly Father, we come before you always in need of your grace and your mercy. We ask, Lord, that as you administer those blessings, that we would always keep in mind that we don't come to these struggles because you're angry with us or because you have stopped loving us. We know that Jesus promised hardship and persecution and grief in this life. And as we walk through the reality of those promises, we also know that he promised to never leave us and that you are always with us in our darkest valleys and even on our most bright mountaintops. We ask, Lord, that you would cause us to really feel that peace and joy that it steps out beyond our circumstances and causes us to give thanks to you no matter what we're facing. We pray for forgiveness between friends. We know, God, that relationships are hard. We know that we all have differences and we all share in a faith to you. Help us to see that shared faith, that shared identity as children of God. Not because of what we've done or because we made the right choices and check the right boxes, but that you adopted each and every one of your children into your family unconditionally. Because even before we were born, you had already picked us. While we may not always understand that, we know it's true. Deep down, Sometimes our doubts and our fears about our relationship to you stem from understanding that we really don't deserve your grace and your mercy. We really don't deserve a seat in your shadow. Yet you invite us in and call us to your side. You draw us into your bosom and hold us tight. And as we wrestle with those doubts and those fears, you're always there to lovingly say, you're mine. Nothing will change that. And maybe it's because we know our own fears and sins and secrets so well that we feel so undeserving. Remind us that it is not those things, yet it is the love of Jesus taking upon our iniquities to himself and giving us his righteousness, that it is not of us but of you that we are called your children. We pray, Lord, for unity in our church body as we walk forward we pray, Lord, that we would remember that you are by our side as a church as much as you are as individuals, that you will call us to grow spiritually, that you will challenge us to question traditions, and that you will highlight for us the amazing history that we have in this church and in this community so that as we honor our past and our Savior, we can step joyfully into a vibrant future. We ask these things together with one mind, with one voice, with one faith. And in that spirit, we share in the prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. of honoring the gifts given to the church and the spirit with which it was given. We would like to offer the opportunity for you to give as you see most worshipful. If you would like to place your offering in the plate, we will have ushers coming down through shortly to do so. If you would like to leave your offering in the box up front or in back, you may do so as you feel comfortable.
Let us pray over your gifts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you always provide and even in ways that we don't maybe feel. And we thank you that we have this opportunity to give in faith that not only will you take care of us, but you have blessed us so much that we can take care of others. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to use these gifts in the spirit that they were given to share your love and your compassion with our community and our world around us. Let these gifts encourage us to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ, not only in Cuba, but around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your kingdom in a small way. Amen. It is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Leon Oakes. He is a retired American Baptist pastor who has served at churches in York and Mumford, Ilion, Auburn, and Manlius, New York, over 40 years of ministry. In his retirement, Pastor Leon serves as the Dean of the American Baptist Church's New York State Lay Study Program, and he has served the First Baptist Church of Hamilton as an interim pastor for one and a half years. He lives in Fayetteville with his wife, Rosie, and they try to keep track of their two sons and families located in Boston and near Washington, D.C. I think my microphone's on. We got it. Bill, thank you for your leadership in, uh, in our worship this morning and uh, uh, for your introduction and just grateful to be able to be here with all of you this morning. Um, we've talked for quite a while over the past few months with the idea of um, uh, my doing some work with all of you as you begin to look forward and uh, Today's an opportunity for us to talk about that and uh, think about it together before we begin that process. So I look forward to meeting more of you as we share a meal after worship this morning. And uh, he mentioned my work with the lay study program in American Baptist churches, and uh, it's grateful this morning to uh, meet Claudia Little, who's been through the program and uh, uh, build her own leadership skills as she, she went through that. And so uh, good to be with you, her this morning here. Um, I'm going to read a scripture this morning, but I want to include that in the preaching of my sermon this morning. So I'm going to begin with a prayer um, before I read this scripture. And uh, then we're going to just sort of talk our way through the scripture uh, from 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 14. Uh, it wasn't until I sat down here that I looked to see what kind of pew Bible do you all have? And I uh, realized contemporary English version, or good news for modern man, we called it when it first came out. And uh, it will be a little different than the scripture I'm reading. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, uh, the scripture I'll be using this morning. And uh, so, but I would encourage you to find that, and we can move through it together. Uh, if you have that uh, open in your, in your Bible, if for anybody who uh, likes to have a page number, um, and I'm going to be putting my glasses on and off as we talk this morning, but it's on 1453, 1452 and 53, where I'm going to be using scripture from, and it'll be just a little different than, than w in terms of the particular words, but, uh, but it'll have the same thoughts in our translations. So let's uh, just begin with a word of prayer. Oh God, may the words of my mouth 
in the meditations, the reflections in each of our hearts bring you honor, be acceptable to you. May we grow together as your people. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now in the text that I use, it begins at verse 6. And uh, uh, in your scripture, 5 and 6 are right together. Actually, 4, 5, and 6, I think. Um, but the setting, uh, the first word in, in verse 6 is for this reason. And uh, what's that reason for? Paul is talking about where Timothy's faith has come from. He's speaking, this is a letter from St. Paul to Timothy, a young leader in the church. And Paul's trying to encourage him, instruct him, help him to strengthen that leadership. And, and I fully believe that as we read the scripture, he's speaking to us like he's speaking to Timothy, giving us what does it mean to be a leader in the church? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Um, these are words being spoken to us. So he says in the, at the beginning of this, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Timothy has the, a gift of God. Timothy has been, is living a faith that he's learned, now the third generation in his family, of following Jesus. And Paul's encouraging him in the life of the church that he's serving. For this reason, Paul says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. It's a little different than your text. Um, I love the words here in the New International Version that say fan into flame. Not just use this. Not just um, uh, get this going in you, but fan it into a flame. That it's not just an ember, like a dying ember in a, in a um, fire, campfire, but it's, it's actually a flame that's active, alive, dancing, uh, uh, effective. Fan into flame that gift of God within you. Psalm 1 begins with this phrase. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Somebody who meditates on the word, who reads it, who thinks about it. Blessed is the one who delights in that. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. To be a follower of Jesus is to have the spirit alive, aflame within you, active, bearing fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Do you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? What does it look like? Do you know that scripture out of Galatians? The fruit of the Spirit brings what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what the fruit of the Spirit, when you have the Spirit of God in you, what's it look like? That's a great description of it. 
It, you see in a person love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's what it looks like when the spirit's alive, when, that, when it has been fanned into flame. Now, a lot of times our lives don't look like that at all, do they? Um, we, but, but that's what, when the spirit's in us, it's what it begins to look like. When we're open to God's Spirit, when we live by that Spirit in our lives, we find life and we become the bearer of life for others. Paul is speaking to Timothy, this young leader, encouraging him and giving him instructions. Let that fame, flame Live in you, fan it, activate it, bring it to life so that you're the kind of person that, that uh, looks like Christ in the world. Be the hands and feet of Christ. How do you be that? That's a pretty tall order. We only can be it because the Spirit is at work within us. Otherwise, we become very self-centered. We become uh, protective. When we're in the Spirit, trusting the Spirit, it, it changes us, and we're more likely to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus. For this reason, I'm reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God in your life. For the Spirit of God gave us, we go on, does not make us timid but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I read a commentator who, who was commenting on this, and he said, some of those verbs don't play well together. <laughs> I like that phrase. Um, and what he was talking about is power, the way we in the world think about power, is the ability to control others. <laughs> Power is something you have over somebody, the control you have. Um, and then the next word, love, just has such a different sense for it. A love that has a sense of openness, of self-giving, of self-sacrificing. How do you put those two together? And yet, God in Jesus Christ is all about the power of love. That love has a power to change the world. Best seen in that picture of Jesus on a cross, self-sacrifice, giving so that others might have life. How many times in your own life have you ever experienced that sense of love where you're maybe hurting yourself for someone else. You're, you're giving up something of yourself in order that somebody else might have more. Somebody else might thrive. Maybe, maybe spending some time and listening in a way that will help to fan the flame of life into somebody else. But I'm willing to step aside for myself. For Paul, the spirit we are given for ministry is both powerful and loving. This powerful love is the power that operates in the heart of God and those who are being made in his image. We are this kind of love most powerfully demonstrated in Jesus. It's our calling to make visible to the world this powerful love. So then Paul says, now we're down to uh, verse 8 in this, so don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Paul's writing this to Timothy from a prison cell. Paul is paying a price for his Christian discipleship. He's, he's um, whatever has caused it, the authorities haven't liked it, the way in which he's loved. 
how he's broken some norms, and by the power of God, he's suffering, he says. And um, then he goes on to say, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This isn't something that we just think up. This is what I want to do. This is what I... But it's because God has given us this purpose, this grace that's in our lives. It's not something we accomplish. It's not something we earn. It's something that God puts in us. And we sort of listen and follow, what is this grace? This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. Paul ch says, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now, if you have a relative who's in prison, um, you may not tell everybody about it. You may have a bit of shame about it. Somebody, the black sheep of my family's ended up in prison. I mean, that's, that's how we think, isn't it? Whatever the reason, that person might be there. Paul says, don't be ashamed of this. What I'm doing, what I'm suffering, is for the gospel. The problem we face in the world is the world doesn't ex respect the power of love. When we love like Jesus, it sometimes hurts. Sometimes we suffer humiliation, a lack of respect by others, loss. Sometimes it just becomes discouraging. Paul's writing from prison in the eyes of the world, he's a loser. In the eyes of the world, Jesus was a loser, dead on a cross. The worst disgrace. Deuteronomy has a thing of one who dies upon a cross is, the, is you know, to be um, not celebrated in any way. But he believes that whatever he has entrusted to God will be guarded and will be fruitful. So there's a, um, if you just go on a little longer with this, um, I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul's sitting in a prison cell. He's invested. He's activated that gift of God in his life. And it could be pretty discouraging. I mean, how am I going to make any difference sitting here? But he says, I'm confident that what God has entrusted, what I've entrusted to God, will be fruitful. God will honor that. It's not going to be wasted. You know, we have a son who is, um, uh, and his wife, have a foster child. Uh, they've, she, this foster child has now been with them for going on two and a half years. She's almost four years old now. Um, they're hoping to adopt this child. Uh, but there's no guarantees about it. Um, priority is always if there's a family member who would raise a child, who would be willing to do that. Um, that would be a priority in social services. Biological connection is, is a prime thing. But, you know, they have invested so much love and poured their lives into this child, and the child is growing. A wonderful child. And, and yet there's still that uncertainty until all the legal processes go through. And uh, I just admire anybody who gets involved in the foster care system to love and gift a child uh, that in the long run 
I have no idea what's going to happen here. I have a friend who we're in college with who um, has worked in social work and worked in the foster care system in New York City for a period of time. And she was talking to us and she made this comment. She said, I absolutely believe that any love and care you put into that child will have a lasting impact. That that will give that child, the child's memory will hang on to whatever it was you gave her and it'll empower more resilience in that child or whatever in the future. It won't be lost. And I thought, that's exactly what Paul's saying here, isn't it? He's saying, whenever you give, I know who I have believed and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that final day. When we enter into a ministry, when we, that gift of God is activated within us and we give something out of love, there is a power in it. And it's not lost. We can't, you know, generations, you're, you're, you raise a child and the child grows up and goes on and you have no control over what they do with their lives, but you live with a confidence that somehow whatever I love, I've been able to pour into this kid, it's going to pay off somehow. And I may never see it. It may be beyond my own lifetime when, when the good of that I can see. You plant a tree that, that you know, won't be there when you, will, will be there when you die. You'll never see the fullness of it. But you invest in it, believing that God, God's Spirit, is at work building and knitting together the things of this world for his kingdom. We believe that, and so we give, and we give out of the goodness and the, the confidence. It's called living by faith. God is knitting together new ways of, of um, touching and transforming people, and we can be a part of that. When we live by the power of love, God's Spirit works in and through us to bring the fruit of the Spirit and transforms the world in which we live. Verse 13. What you heard from me keep is a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This passage is packed with so much, but I really do have trouble getting beyond those words, fan into flame, activate that gift of God. You've seen people alive in the Spirit, in your own life, in your own church, bold and courageous people, secular word we use for that, sometimes passionate people, people who really care about something and give a lot to it. Sometimes when we meet those people, sometimes those people seem hot, like the flame is really hot and we really don't want to touch it. Uh, other times that flame has a warm spirit in it that just draws us to it. Paul's telling Timothy, who's becoming a leader in the church, to fan the flame of the gift of God he's received. Don't let it lie dormant. How do we let it fan into flame? Um, I think mostly we, we know the disciplines of the Christian faith. Find a time for prayer where you can be connected to God. Um, brief times during the day, maybe long periods of time. But everybody has a different kind of prayer life. But, but allow time where God can help to fan that flame. Maybe sometimes it's just being still, not saying anything, listening, just being open. Studying the Word of God, doing 
taking a text like this and trying to figure out what is it that's being said? How does this connect to my life? Worship together. You're here together. You're just by being present to each other and, and, and acknowledging God together. But I think more than anything, it's that part of being the community of God's people, being together, fanning the flame of God's gift in each of you to each other has powerful Im impact in the world, being a community. Paul's words in Ephesians are that the gifts given to leaders were to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And that work is to encourage and to teach and to inspire each other. But the, when the flame of God's gifts are fanned, they burn bright, the gifts become clear and evident. Ministries of hope and power often emerge because someone has had a gift fanned into flame. I've seen it happen in churches. I, can, I, I have a picture in my mind of what it looks like when that happens, when people um, know that God is calling them to something and they're ready to, to respond to that call and to live it. You know, I was, a, um, I was a interim pastor in Hamilton, New York for a year and a half after I retired. And uh, there's a wonderful ministry in that church uh, that Colgate University is there. And Colgate has a number of international students who come to learn and are away from home for the first time. They're, you know, college freshman age, young, first time away from home. And uh, they have a dinner where these international students come to the church. And sometimes it was 40 students, and sometimes it was 70 or more students who were there. It was a wild time. I mean, people from across the globe, from Europe, from Africa, from uh, Asia, um, just, you know, it's sort of like a Pentecost gathering of all of people. Um, not all of them Christians. Uh, some, some are Muslim, some are other religions that are there. But their focus is, they know this is a Christian church. They're experiencing Christian hospitality. They're being exposed to something they probably would never see in their own countries. Jody, who leads this, um, 13 years old, a bit rebellious, found a um, church. Parents didn't go to church. She found a church, Assembly of God Church and began going, being part of it. And what she noticed at that church, what she remembers, is the missionaries who came from all over the world. <laughs> missionaries who came and told their stories. She's fascinated by those stories. Would she become, in her career, a travel agent? <laughs> began helping people travel around the world and see the world, and she got to do a little bit of that. But in her church, she was living in Oneonta at the time, in her church there was a woman who said to her, Jody, we could do this, we could reach out to the students who are here from other places and share the love of Jesus with these people. And Jody had this wonderful vision, we could do that. And right in the middle of figuring out a way to do it, her husband gets a job in Hamilton, and off she goes. It wasn't the right season for the ministry that she was envisioning. Years later, she is um, talking to somebody who is leaving Colgate, a bit dejected. She sees this guy, talks to him, and he's from, I think, China maybe, or some southeastern country. And she said to him, this is something I've always thought about doing. Would that have made any difference to you? And he said, I think it would have. I think that would have made a big difference to me. And, you know, the, God puts her in this place, and that gift that's in her gets fanned a little. The flame begins to burn a little. And so she, she knows that Colgate, separation of church and state's big there. They're not going to have a program in a church and, and all this. But she calls up a woman 
uh, who's in charge of international students' relations with them. She calls her up, and this, and this woman says to her, I've been trying, one of the assignments I have, she says, let's have lunch together, and she tells her in that, one of the assignments I have is find a way to support these kids. And she, she was very open to the idea the church might host a dinner for them, that the college would be supportive of. And it just took off once over a few years. It, you know, she says, the kids will come and they'll tell each other, no, you don't have to worry, they're not going to proselyte you down there, they're, you know, it's okay, you can go. And what a, I mean, I've gone to that dinner several times and it's just a lot of life and sharing in it. Um, people from the church help prepare the meal. Another group of people come in and clean up afterwards. Somebody, when I was there, said, but really it's Paul and Jody's ministry. You know, it's really not the church. And I said, church can't do it without, they can't do it without you. This is the church's ministry. It's just that God put a special gift in someone who activated that, ready to move forward, and you're part of the plan. <laughs> you're coming alongside that person. I mean, it's really no different than when you have a vacation Bible school, right? Somebody in your church wants to do this vacation Bible school, and other people say, not me, I can't do that, but I could do this. And somebody else says, I could do this. And pretty soon you've got a vacation Bible school growing. I know a church that had an um, empty parsonage next door to the church, and uh, somebody in that church said, there's a need for a clothing ministry in this, in this community. And they turned the parsonage into a, into a clothing ministry. One couple in that church really, you know, got the key to the, the parsonage and opened the doors and, you know, did that and then called in the volunteers. This little church with 14, 15 people in worship every Sunday starts a clothing ministry in their community. You know, because, because somebody listened to the spirit, the gifts that God had placed in them, allowed that flame of the spirit be fanned, that, that gift of the spirit, uh, the spark that was there be fanned into a flame and acted on it. I wonder what the season is of, um, of the uh, Cuba First Baptist Church. You know, what, what season are you in? I've, I know a bit about it. I've been talking to Bill, and, and last night we had dinner of three of us, just talking a little bit about the church. And, uh, and I know that you, you are a church, the hands and feet of Jesus is a, is a vision of what you This idea of, of ministry and reaching out to a community is not something that's foreign to you. You understand that. But how, what kind of ministry, what's the new season that you're moving into? Uh, churches have seasons that come and go. Ministries that are vibrant and, and God is alive in them. And then uh, moving into a new season. It, it's all about us listening and being attentive to the Spirit. Where is God leading us now? My prayer for is that you'll be open to that season. I'm confident that God has a purpose for Cuba First Baptist, and it will re be revealed in its season. I'm confident that God has gifted people in this church, and that there's a gift that when fanned into flame will be the passion that drives you forward. In the meantime, practice listening, being still, offering yourself, encouraging each other. When you move forward, it may not be easy. It may cost time and treasure and being misunderstood and being criticized. But if it's in God, God in his time will work it out, and in its season it'll come to blossom. If you're firm in Christ, humble to hear and learn, God will knit the pieces together, and you will be surprised. Sometimes it takes courage just to share a dream. 
or to share a movement of God in your life. Don't be timid. Trust that God's gift is real. And when in fellowship you share, you'll let others fan that gift into flame. And you'll find, you'll be surprised by the courage that God gives you to do what his plan is for you, for this church, for this community, for the world we're living in. Amen. We're going to have a time at the table where you're invited to, uh, to be in relationship to God in a very personal way, and to do that together as a community. You know, in the, in the scriptures, Jesus is always the guest at the table. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, Joanna, Susanna, he was the guest. At the meal tables of the wealthy, where he would plead the case of the poor, he was always the guest. Upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger, he was always the guest. But here, when he is at table with his disciples, Jesus was always the host. So those who wish to serve Jesus first have to let him serve you. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. Those who would wash his feet must first be made clean by him. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who are hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world, come to this table. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites you to be guests at his table. Amen.
On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and he said to his disciples, this is the, my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which was shed for you. As often as you drink from this, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread or drink from the cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. This is his gift to us, his table. Um, I'm, I'm a novice at this, of finding the bread in this, uh, and I, I think I know how to do it. But uh, if you open the bread, we can receive that together. And um, I did it. The bread of life offered for us, let us receive. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, the cup of salvation offered for us, let us receive. The table of our Lord is an open table, a table of, um, that's drawing us to be God's disciples, Jesus' disciples. And he celebrates that we're here and receiving of the grace that has been freely offered us. Um, go from this place to be his disciples. I think we sing a hymn, do we, next? 297. Let's sing together.
thing I, you know, you sing a song, it brings back memories. I, the last church that I served, there was a retired pastor who was part of that church, and that was his favorite song. And knowing his story, it was a story that was a pattern of his own life, you know, of uh, finding Jesus and, and being confident of uh, the future uh, in Jesus. Um, so I encourage you today as you leave this worship to go trusting in the love of Jesus who has come that you might have life and have it in abundance and serve the people of this community who want life and sometimes don't know quite where to look for it. We've learned. Let Jesus show you the way that all people might have the life of goodness, the grace that Jesus is offering. Amen.